Hallelujah. Welcome back, my brothers and sisters in Christ, to session 11 of the New Creation Teaching Series. I entitled this session, The Inheritance of the New Creation, which is the inheritance of salvation, the inheritance that we received at the moment of salvation. And I'm so stirred up in my spirit and excited to share with you today a few of, the, a few of these ex uh, extraordinary things that we received in our spirit at the moment of salvation from God freely. Uh, freely given to us and included in the gospel, in the Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. So if you're ready today, uh, let's begin. We, I will talk about today about 10, 10 items, 10 things that are included in the gospel, in the, in the inheritance of, uh, of the new creation. Two of them we already covered. The first one is the, the gift, the free gift of no condemnation forever. We discussed that in detail in sessions eight, seven and eight. Then the second uh, thing of the inheritance of salvation that we can enjoy and use here on earth is sanctification by grace through faith, motivated by love. And we discussed that already in detail in session six about grace and, and then nine when we talked about motivation. So now we, 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 we have left eight things that I want to share with you from this great inheritance, from the riches of the glory of this inheritance that God, the, our Father, has put in us, the saints, has put in, in the saints who are in the light. And we have that eternal life. We have that gift of eternal life. The third thing, so the third thing that with, with which I will begin today, our, uh, our study is the complete authority over the devil. Included in our inheritance is complete and full uh, authority over the devil. Not only authority, legal authority, but ability and power over all the power of the devil. And let's see a few verses, Bible verses that show us exactly this. The first Bible passage that I'll read today comes from Luke 10, 19. Let's read it together. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing, nothing will injure you. These serpents and scorpions in the Bible, they are demons. They are devils. And Jesus says this, uh, tells his disciples that he, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, over all the power of the devil. That's a, such an encouragement verse. This is one of the key verses that I memorized and I all I did declare regularly in my prayer. I, I have power and authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall un injure me by any means. Nothing shall hurt me by any means. The devil is under my feet. I am the son of God, the, the, the devil's master and people's servant. We are called to reign in life and to serve people, to govern over sin, over darkness, over sickness, over poverty, over all the, to destroy destroy the works of darkness. So we have that authority. Now let's move on to 1 John 4.4 4, where it says this, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Because, why? Because greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. Greater is Christ in you than he that is in the world. Greater is God that is in you than he that is in the world. That's another verse that's su uh, such a wonderful verse and powerful verse that I declare and you can declare and meditate and proclaim in your prayer time. And not only whenever you face circumstances uh, that are um, against you, uh, you take that word and declare, greater is Jesus Christ in me than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. And that strengthens us in our faith. Another passage from Matthew 28, 18 to 19. Jesus is speaking here and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit look what Jesus is saying here all authority that means all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth all means all that means the devil has none all authority belongs to Jesus Christ. Therefore, go. Why therefore? Because Jesus Christ is saying, go into all the world. Because I am in you and you in me. And I have all authority. I am the head of all rule and authority. And I am backing you up. Uh, wherever you go, I'll back you up. I will support you. You have my authority. Ephesians says that he is seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places. And in that heavenly places, 
I, you have my authority in heaven and earth. Go fear, therefore and make disciples. Use that authority over the devil and bring people into the kingdom of God and make them disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy. Isn't that great? I hear many times Christians saying, oh, I gave, uh, I opened the door for the devil in that area where I, I gave authority to the devil. The devil has no authority. He abuses he, uh, he abuses his power, his ability, but he has no uh, legal authority whatsoever to come, especially in the life of a believer. He can torment the, uh, the, the people that are not in Christ, but he has no authority whatsoever to torment uh, believers or uh, the new creation, believers that are in Christ. He has no authority. If he tor torments you or come against you, it's illegal. And you have the authority and power to cast him out, to tell him to go, command him to go in the name of Jesus. That's such a wonderful, that's the authority of the believer. And that's included in the inheritance of the new creation. It belongs to you and you can use it here on earth. In your circumstances, when you face any effect of sin, any effect of darkness, any work of darkness, you can destroy it both in your life and the life of other people. You can be a blessing to other people and you can be of help. Amen. I prepared also other Bible references that I will not read because of time uh, that are related to our authority over the devil. And we also discussed in detail in the first session when I, th I, talk I talked about the heavenly places and the authority of the believer in Christ in the heavenly places in the invisible realm that uh, occupies the same space, the same, the heavenly places are the, the, is the spiritual realm all around us, the invisible realm. And we have the highest authority in Christ in that realm. Uh, so the other Bible references that talk about our authority are Mark 3 verses 14 to 15, Mark 6 verse 7, Mark 16 verse 17, and Luke 9 verse 1. So you are free to take all these verses and study on your own and see how wonderful, what authority and power Jesus Christ has has given us. Next, the fourth item, the fourth thing that is included in our inheritance in the, in the testament that Jesus Christ has given us in the new covenant is physical health, divine physical health. What I mean by that is power to walk continuously in physical health for yourself and to heal other people freely, both believers and unbelievers. Uh, divine physical health, I will say here a very powerful statement that is based on study and the, of revelation. And then I will, I will bring a few passages that will uh, show from the Bible uh, the statement that I'm going to uh, say. Divine physical health, it is freely and fully included in the gospel and in, in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross side by side with the forgiveness of sins, with justification, and with sanctification. And I will say it again because this is a powerful statement and the devil doesn't like it when I say it. Divine physical health, it is freely and fully included in the gospel and in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross side by side with forgiveness of sins or remissions of sins, justification and sanctification. The perfect will of God for those who are in Christ is to walk in continuous health for themselves and to heal anybody, anytime, anywhere. Whenever you face, it doesn't depend on God, it doesn't depend on the atmosphere, it doesn't depend on the culture of the people, it doesn't depend on anything. And I'll say that because I love it so much. The perfect will of God for those who are in Christ Jesus is for them to walk in continuous health for themselves, both for themselves and to heal anybody, anytime, anywhere. Amen. Just by faith. And we don't, whenever I say that, we don't deny, we, when we pray for sick people, I don't, we don't deny the presence of sickness. Or if you feel sick by saying that we are not sick when in fact we, we are and we feel that sickness. But what we are denying is the right of that sickness to remain there. And we have the right to command it to go in the name of Jesus by faith and the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We deny its right. Any sickness. It's illegal. Christ can never be sick. 
Christ is in you and you are in Christ. You are no longer, you don't longer, no longer exist. You no longer live, but Christ lives in you. So Christ can never be sick. He was never sick when he was in, on this earth, physically sick. And he healed every disease and every sickness that he faced in people. And his sufferings were not sufferings of sickness or sufferings of darkness. His sufferings were suffering of persecution, suffering of the cross for the sake of God, for the task that he had to accomplish. But he never suffered of sickness. And Christ in you can never be sick. So whenever you feel sick or you have a sickness in your body, know for sure and for certain that sickness is is illegal in your body and he has it has to leave let's take a few bible passages that talk about our this right uh, this inheritance in the in the gospel matthew 10 1 says this jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness you are included in, the, in, the, in those disciples, not just the 12th. He then sent 70s and then he sent us into all the world uh, exactly as he was sent. What did he do when he was on this earth? He, he began doing good to people, healing the people wherever he went. And the Bible says in John 20, 21 that the Father has sent us exactly as he sent Jesus in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit. L uh, look here, the, he sent them to heal, not to pray for healing. You will never see prayer for healing. Uh, probably in James, but it's it's a it's a special case. But always, people, uh, Jesus said, "Heal." That means go to people and say, "Be healed in the name of Jesus." Not a long prayer, not a long uh, fasting, and they, but heal every kind every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And that was before the cross. Can you imagine that? All the more after the cross, we have this, this mandate, this calling to go to people and heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Matthew 10, 8. Again, Jesus says here, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, demons. Freely you receive, freely give. Hallelujah. I'm so excited. This is one of the my key verses, memory verse that I memorize and I keep in my heart and I declare and I proclaim for my life. Let's look a little bit in the Old Testament in Exodus 15, 26. Even in the Old Testament, let's read this passage. Uh, God says to the people, uh, God said to the people of Israel, and he said, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I'll put none of the diseases on, on you which I have put on the Egyptians. For I the Lord am your healer. Amen. You can you see even in the Old Testament, if people obey the law, it was a little bit harder for them. But if people obey the law they, and God's statutes, they would have access to physical healing. God promised that uh, based on their obedience of the law of the statutes, they will get physical healing. They will live in health. All the more now in Christ who fulfilled all the law or who fulfilled all those commandments, all those statutes, all the more now we have assured physical health in, in the gospel, in the atonement that Jesus Christ won and gained, paid for in full at the cross. Let's move on. Psalm 103 verses 2 to 3 says this. Let's read it together. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. And he goes, the psalmist goes on and on and describes all the benefits of God. So he says, forget none of his benefits. These are the benefits of, of salvation. That means, that is what it means to be saved, not only from, from hell in the future life, but salvation from the effects of sin on this earth. You are preserved, that preserved from sickness, from poverty, from curse, from failure, from weakness, from depression, confusion. That, that is what it means to be saved. And that's what Jesus Christ has paid on the cross. So look here, forget none of his benefits. And he describes of both uh, those benefits as equal measure. And this is in the Old Testament. He says, what are the benefits? Who pardons all your iniquities. That means forgives all your sins or re takes away all your sins. Then next, next one, it says, who heals 
all your diseases not one not partially all your diseases that's a promise that's a benefit of people that are in christ jesus that the people that have a covenant with god hallelujah matthew 8 16 to 17 when evening came this is a powerful passage when evening came they brought to him many who were demon possessed and he jesus cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill this was to fulfill what was spoken through isaiah the prophet he himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases look at this passage jesus healed all all who were ill not a few not all that came to jesus left healed and here is the context here we see that uh, the context is about physical healing jesus healed all people of uh, all those who were ill who were sick and just after jesus cast out demons and healed all who were ill the passage quotes in seven, verse 17 guess what passage it quotes the the isaiah 53 verses 4 to 5 and says that what jesus did by casting out demons and heal all sicknesses heal all who are ill what jesus did was a fulfillment of that old testament scripture and let's read that uh, te old testament scripture from isaiah 53 verses 4 to 5 surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for, for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. This, this refers to physical healing, griefs that he bore that by his scourging we are healed this is what jesus did and fulfilled the scripture in, in uh, when he came on the earth hallelujah because a lot of people argue that isaiah 53 verses 4 to 5 doesn't talk about physical healing but only about mental illness about sorrows about sadness about uh, things of the soul but G jesus says clearly here in the, this passage from matthew 8 17 says that jesus by healing the sick fulfill what isaiah prophesied that by his scourging we are healed praise god a few more verses here luke 5 the verses 20 to 25 let's read it together it isn't this great isn't it exciting the word of god to read the word of god and see that it, what it applies to us and how to apply how to benefit from what jesus has paid at the cross luke 5 20 to 25 seeing their faith he said friend your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason saying, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins have been forgiven you? Or to say, Get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. Immediately he got up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. What Jesus is saying here, guys, both forgiveness one sins and healing them of sickness they are both impossible they are both difficult and hard to do they are both difficult difficult to accomplish so in order to prove to you that i can forgive sins as well which is an unseen thing is a spiritual thing i will heal this person physically as well so by doing one miracle that is equally required for forgiveness of sin uh, um, I hope that you realize that I also have authority to forgive sins. And one, one more interesting, so both forgiveness, in this passage, both forgiveness of sin, uh, sins and healing of sickness, Jesus puts them on the same, same place. None of them is easier. Well, I mean, it's easier for him who is the son of God, but it, it, none of them is, they are equally difficult. They are equally the, the same. Amen. So Jesus does both for that man. He heals his sickness and then forgives his sins. But it, one more thing is interesting here. It's interesting that the Pharisees did not have any problem with Jesus healing the sickness, but they had a problem with the forgiveness of sins. He, they said that who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, in our day, in the 20 sec, uh, 21st century, is the other way around. 
Christians have a problem with physical healing that is not in the gospel. That God, there are a lot of reason, a, a lot of sacred cows, a lot of uh, reason for God not to heal a person. Uh, but we, we don't have any problem with forgiveness of sin. We receive forgiveness of sin very easily. But when it comes to physical healing, a lot of Christians had a, had a problem with, had a struggle. And I my guess is that Forgiveness of sins is not sin, it's something spiritual, but physical healing because it's sin and you you face with the fact that you need to see something tangible, the sickness go, and uh, many times it doesn't go away immediately. Uh, that's the reason why people found all kind of excuses, all kind of theological reasons for people not getting healed, but we will see that the will of God for, for people is to be healed. Even though we don't see it, we, even though we don't see it immediately sometimes, we have to persevere and build ourselves in faith and pray and pray in tongues and continue to pray for the sick until we see results, until we see people delivered because the devil abuses his ability, his power and torments people and we have to release people. We have to deliver people from their sickness. Amen. Let's move on to Romans 8.32. Where it says this, let's read it together. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Hey, this is a powerful verse. God has already given and sacrificed his most precious possession for us, his son. Can you realize that? He gave his only begotten son. All the more he will freely give us all things, including physical healing. Is physical healing higher than the Son of God? Is it more difficult for, the, for God to give us healing when, since he already has given us the Son of God, his most precious possession? I was saying earlier because we, we face a, a tangible issue. We, we pray for sick people and we don't see results immediately. Then we get discouraged and we, we don't pray anymore for sick. But I want to ask you something. Has any one of you has seen heaven? We put our faith in Jesus Christ for heaven and for being uh, delivered from hell. But has any one of you seen heaven? Ha, uh, has seen this tangible uh, realm of heaven where we will go, where the Bible promises that we will go after we die. There are a few people that went, they had a clinical death and they went on the other side and came back. But normally, usually, the normal Christian that has not seen the future life and the, uh, the future, uh, the new heaven and the new earth, and still we believe. We believe and we, this is our hope. In the same way as with, uh, with sickness, although we don't see immediately, we don't see all the time results, the, our legal right, our right in Christ is to see results, to see all the time. And when we don't see, we don't get, get discouraged, but we take more word into ourselves, we renew our mind more, we pray more in tongues until our spirit, we get strengthened in our spirit and, and the power of God gets released. We settle down. Actually, we don't build ourselves into something, but we settle down. Our fight, as I said, is a fight of of rest is a fight of faith is a fight of settling down on the truth of God about healing when we take all these obstacles all these uh, arguments all these strongholds from our minds that physical healing is not for the Christian is not God doesn't always want to give that healing when we take those out then healing is free to flow through the grace of God because of it's only by faith it's not by anything exactly like holiness and any other thing that's uh, coming in the gospel one more verse uh first peter 2 24 and this is uh, uh again a key passage for healing that supports healing in the gospel and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin that's what we discussed so far in detail and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed so not only died to sin and lived to righteousness, but also by his wounds, by his stripes, we were physically healed. It's something that has already been done. Jesus has bought physical healing for all people 2,000 years ago. It, sta it stays in the heavenly places and awaits to be released by our faith into any, any person that needs healing and deliverance from sickness so we were already healed we already have healing in the past we just need to accept uh, to access it to accept it to receive it to lambano it 
to take it by faith and to release it in our body and to into the bodies of other people of other uh, people that know know God or don't know God so we were healed we are not healed we are not trying to get healed we are not trying to build ourselves to produce healing but we were healed we just uh, we just say it by word be healed and healing that is already available flows through us through our spirits through our bodies Hallelujah. And I prepared again other references that support physical healing from Psalm 107 verse 20, Matthew 4, 23, Matthew 9, 35. Now I want to talk a little bit about what happens. What is the reason why, very briefly, people don't get healed all the time or immediately. And I'll take a verse from Matthew 17, 20, where we see a case where disciple, the disciples of Jesus tried to heal a person and they did exactly what Jesus did, and they couldn't. They couldn't heal. They couldn't cast out the, uh, the spirits from that person. And when they asked Jesus why we couldn't uh, heal that person, Jesus uh, gives them an answer. And the fact that they asked him, Jesus, why we could not heal him, that means Jesus did exactly the same thing that they did. Otherwise, they wouldn't ask because they would have they have would have seen that Jesus did something differently, and they wouldn't ask. They would say, "Ah, that, so that's what we didn't do." But Jesus did exactly the same thing what they did with Jesus' work, but with them it didn't work. So that's why the disciples asked why Jesus it didn't work with us. So let's read this this the answer uh, Jesus's answer. To that question, Matthew 17, 20. And he said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. Another translation says, Because of your unbelief. So Jesus' answer without any argument was because of your unbelief. The cause of the reason why it didn't work for you while it worked before in other cases is because of your unbelief. You decreased in your, in your faith. The faith, and I will say here a very powerful thing, faith always works. Faith will always work. If it did not work and a sick person uh, that was prayed for was not healed or not delivered, then it was not real faith or it was unbelief. That's the only reason why people don't get healed. There's no other re reason, period. And uh, I talked about faith that it doesn't, you don't have faith in your faith. You can have, it just says, if you have the faith of the size of a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, move here from, from here to there and, and it will move. So it's not the size of your faith, but the size of the God in which you put your faith. And I think in this particular case with the with disciples, all they have needed to do was to persevere a little bit more. When they saw that it didn't happen, they shouldn't back off or withdraw, but continue and persevere and continue to command for the person to, to be healed and uh, uh, she or he would have been healed. And usually when we pray for sick persons, for sick people, and we see no results, we have to blame somebody. That's our human nature. We have to put the blame on someone. And this is interesting, and I want us to, I want us with an open heart and open mind to see and identify these things, because there are, there are a different person on which we put the blame. So the first level of blame that we usually uh, put is the blaming the sick person. A sick person comes up to us, comes to me, I pray for that sick person, it does, she does, she or he doesn't get healed, and then we put the blame in a very and uh, elegant and subtle way on the sick person. And we say things like, we think and tell the sick person that they either have a sin in their life, a sin, a hidden sin in their life that blocks the healing or not enough faith. And that's wrong. That's not, that's not fair for the sick person. The person is already sick and uh, that the people, the, those people are already sick and they are, if they are in search for help. They came to you for help. They didn't come for you to, to judge them and to tell them that they have sins in their life or they, they don't have enough faith. Sin, which is the source of all evils, did not stop God from saving you and me. Sin did not stop God from saving us. So why would we think that it can stop God from healing us? 
Sin will not stop God from healing us. That period. That's, a, that's, that's the truth. That's the reality. Sin will never stop God to bless us or to heal us. That was in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, sin no longer blocks God because sin was paid for at the cross by Jesus Christ. The sick person does not necessarily need to have faith. When we say you don't have enough faith, the person does not need to have faith. Jesus always healed everybody regardless of their faith. Whenever people that were sick and came to him had faith, Jesus used their faith. And he many times he said, your faith has made you well. Your faith has healed you. But whenever there wasn't uh, faith on the side of the sick person, Jesus used his own faith. And he still accomplished and healed all people, every kind of disease, every kind of ill. So there's no excuse. So there, this is a, a wrong blame, a wrong uh, way of blaming for, for the lack of results of the sick person. And I encourage you, don't let's, let's not do that again. Those sick per- people are already oppressed by the devil. Why, why should we add on that and make them think and make, make them guilty? Everything that brings guilt, that brings shame, that brings torment it's not from God it's not from the spirit of God especially in the new covenant it's from the devil so let's not put uh, an extra weight on those sick people so that's the first level of blame the second level of blame which is uh, even more subtle is God God himself whenever people don't get uh, healed God has some sovereign will or hidden purpose through our sickness and he does not want to heal you or me or us or whatever is the case because of his some sovereign will or hidden will of God, the hidden purpose that he has with us. Now I'm telling you, if that is true, if, if, the, if God's will is for you to be sick and remain sick, then why wouldn't we ask for more? For more sickness so that we will we'll fulfill even more God's will. If God's will is for you to be sick and remain sick, let's look for more so that God will, God's will will be perfected in us and we will fulfill because we want to do God's will. Or if it's God's will to be sick, whenever we, we, we can find a medical treatment on the market or uh, at the hospital with doctors, why do we go to the doctors if it's God's will for us to remain sick? Why do we look for medicine? Why do we look for doctors? Do you see the logical fallacy here? Why would we look to be treated and healed if we believe that it's God's will for us to be sick? It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's illogical. Or even why do we search for prayer to get rid of sickness if you believe that it's God's will he has some hidden purpose with you to, to teach you something uh, uh, and to, through that sickness. God paid through Jesus' sacrifice too costly of a price. Too costly of a price that, so that he would play around with sickness on people to teach them something. God does not play with sickness on people to teach them something or to discipline them. Or That was in the Old Testament, not in the New. Moreover, he would not reveal clearly in scripture his will related to sickness like we saw even jesus's life reflects god's will jesus the father was in jesus and jesus says if you've seen me you've seen the father so whatever jesus did healing people that's the will of the father that's the desire of the father i remember some some uh, in the new testament some person came to jesus and asked jesus uh, teacher if it's your will have mercy on my son and Jesus said, yes, it's my will. Bring your son. Be healed. Why would God reveal in his scripture, especially in the New Testament, his, his will so clearly related to sickness, to physical healing, so that afterwards, from time to time, he would have some kind of hidden sovereign will with our lives that involved sickness and contradicted bluntly his already revealed will. He, God does not contradict his will. And one more important thing here. If, if that's true, if God has sometimes some hidden purpose or will, and we never know, you can never know if God in a specific case, he has some purpose, some, or if he wants or he doesn't want to, if that was true, you can never know, and that undermines your faith. You will never have confidence and boldness and faith to pray for another sick person, not knowing if God wants to heal that person or if God, God's will is to heal that person. So I want to tell you, 
you can have full confidence, full faith to pray for any sick person because God's perfect will revealed in the Bible and done, expressed through Jesus' life is to heal anybody, anytime, anywhere. Praise the Lord. Praise God. He's so wonderful. And God is able, and now one more thing here, God is able to accomplish any hidden purpose, any will with us directly through his spirit without using the devil's tools like sickness, which is an effect and result of sin entering into the world. If sin has not entered into the world, had not entered into the world, sickness would, would not exist. So God does not use devil's tool to teach his children something. A normal father and mother will not put a cancer on their own children to teach them something or to discipline something. The discipline that God talks about in Hebrew 12, it's, it's, it's something else. And I will talk about that objection when, in the, when I will do a separate, well, about all objections, about Hebrew 12, the discipline of God, about the uh, uh, Paul's thorn, about the Epaphroditus who was sick, all, kind, all these objections to physical healing, I will answer them all in a future series about that is dedicated fully to physical healing. I will answer all them here. I want just briefly to, to talk about the inheritance of the new creation. Let's move on. So the, the first level of blame was the sick person. The second level is God. And I want to put off, destroy this thing about God's mysterious ways and thoughts. Let's read the Isaiah 55, 6 to 9. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God. For he will abundantly abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways declares the lord for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts a lot of christian take uh, christians take these two verses eight and nine from this context and say oh my, our thoughts uh, god's thoughts are not our thoughts his ways are not our ways his uh, his thoughts and ways are higher than our ways so we never know what he wants to do with us, especially when it comes to physical healing. We never know God, but God's will and thoughts. But look at the, the context of this um, quotation, of, this, uh, of these two verses. The context is, in verse 7, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. So the context is, God is saying, I will have compassion on the sinner. I will abundantly pardon them because my, th my thoughts are not your thoughts. You want to punish them. You want, they deserve punishment. But my thoughts, my desires, my ways are higher. They are, they are the ways and thoughts of love. God is love. That's the context of compassion, of pardoning. Not about, feel, uh, about physical healing or sickness or anything like that. And the third level of blame, uh, that's the last one, is us or our unbelief. This is the correct um, place where we, we should put our blame. In fact, it's not blame, but responsibility. This is the level and this is the place that few believers reach and take responsibility for the lack of results in praying for the sick. Why? Because it is always very difficult to admit that we ourselves are the problem. In every area of our life, it's very difficult to admit that we have a problem, that we need to take responsibility. And sometimes, when we, even when you hear that, a lot of Christians might say, Oh, you want, you conde you're condemning me. You're putting pressure on me. No, I'm not condemning you. But that's the truth. I, I want to encourage you to take responsibility and persevere in faith and not give up. And just feel complacent only with forgiveness of sin and the future salvation from hell. I want to encourage you as a believer, take responsibility. You'll not lose anything. If it doesn't work, continue and persevere. Believe. God will reward your faith, not your results. Now, think about with me. Between this, I pray for sick people, I don't get results. And, and a person who does not pray at all, doesn't have faith, whom do you think God will reward? It's better to have faith and pray even when you don't see results and continue and persevere until you see results than not pray at all. God will reward that faith. God will honor that faith even if you don't see results until the end of your life. 
keeping the truth and proclaiming the truth of God, that's what you will be rewarded for. And when I talk about taking responsibility for a lack of results, some of you may be angry on me or when you hear those things and reasonably so, especially when it comes, when you think about close people, friends and relatives that you prayed for and then after that they died. And believe me, I experienced at least four people dear to me, three adults and an infant, a baby, uh, three adults uh, sick of cancer for which I prayed and after that I prayed intensely and consistently and perseverantly and after that they died and uh, also a baby who was born and lived for six hours and then she died and for me it was very difficult and I understand you very well so when you listen to this I, I want you to understand my heart because I've been there and people died on me after they received prayer after I put my faith and it took me a while to recover but the truth stands the truth about healing it, it stands that it's god's will for for people to be healed so indirectly the problem is still with us but when i say that we need to take responsibility for healing the sick and for for when faith doesn't work or for lack of results i don't mean it in this way like if you if you pray and if you don't get results and people are are not healed you are guilty you are to be blamed not in that way because at that moment uh, when you put your faith and prayed for those people you did your best you did everything you could it would mean that i would tell you that you didn't you did not do your best for your close friends or your close relatives and you did at that moment in time when you pray and the fact that you put your faith and prayed for those people it, it means that you love those people it means that you put your faith and you did everything you could i'm not talking about taking responsibility in that way but taking responsibility for exercising faith and believing that it's always God's will to heal people and mostly taking this responsibility means uh, means doing something day to day before you get to that moment of crisis when you face a sick person or a dying person I refer more to renewing our mind daily thinking meditating on verses about healing about the different aspects of life different aspects of life taking the word in us praying in tongues and build ourselves up in faith so when we face that moment of crisis we will be ready to face it and overcome it so taking responsibility is twofold for before day-to-day -day responsibility to believe that it's God's will to renew our mind to meditate to pray and when we face the moment of Christ to put our faith and believe and pray to the last moment and if the person dies it's not easy but in, in the same time we don't have to take that blame we we have to encourage ourselves it will be hard but encourage ourselves and persevere believing that the next time we'll have complete victory and on in this year of responsibility although i said it's not god to blame or the sick uh, uh, it's only us i still believe there is a small dose of god's sovereignty but not in relation to his will for healing but in relation to your person or to your future. For instance, if we think about Jesus, the Bible doesn't say anything. Jesus did not do any miracle until he was 30 years of age. So he did not do any miracle, any healing, anything. When he was 30 years of age, he was baptized and then he started doing miracles. Sometimes people might not get healed, at least at this moment. This is one of the reasons. Another reason besides lack of faith that I would see of not getting people healed because when you start healing people on a daily basis and raising the dead even if you don't want to you will begin a public ministry and uh, you have to be ready for that and the rate of your renewal like when you pray in tongues you don't have control over the tongues you don't know how much of those tongues renew your mind and build in faith and prepare you for some moments but let's trust God and take responsibility I'll take another analogy with the hell and people that go to hell or people are, are, who are saved if a lot of people will go to hell and that is, that's a tragic thing and if you think about it, it's not God's fault. We cannot blame God for people going to hell because it's their fault. It's too fault. It's their fault because they didn't accept Jesus Christ as their Lord. They are responsible. They didn't take responsibility to, to believe the gospel and to trust God for their salvation. But on, the, uh, on another hand, 
there is also God who who searches the hearts of people who who convinces by the Holy Spirit. Now there are people that are, are, are stirred up by the Holy Spirit where it takes a longer time to receive Jesus in their hearts. So we don't know why in certain issues, in certain situations, the Holy Spirit waits a little bit longer for the person to be convinced and to receive. In what measure does the Holy Spirit uh, impress a person or influence a person? Or um, in what rate uh, does, it, does the Holy Spirit convince a person? Uh, if, I mean, the Holy Spirit could do it faster or in a longer time. In certain people, they receive Jesus instantly. Some other take longer time. So there is a small dose of God's sovereignty in this, but not in relation to His will. His will to heal is always to heal. Uh, and uh, and the, the, the primary cause is our lack of faith or our weak faith. And, uh, and faith comes by hearing the word in that area, of, for instance, healing. Uh, faith comes when you hear the word about healing, when you meditate on it and you start believing and you pray and you start seeing results slowly by slowly from small things to bigger things. So I want you to understand my heart and to not feel guilty and to not feel condemned in the same way when I tell you that the, the whole world goes to hell and it's your responsibility to tell them about the gospel. Uh, how do you feel? You should feel the same way when I tell you you are responsible for people, for sick people who are not getting healed. It's exactly the same thing. People go to hell on one hand because we don't go as as much as we we need to to tell them about the gospel. Then it's their responsibility to receive, and then it's also the Holy Spirit who convinces them. So in the same way, you don't feel as guilty when you think about so, so many people going to hell you cannot take it on you like having that messiah complex and oh if i don't do this people die In the same way with sick people you don't need to have a messiah complex or feel guilty and down whenever a person dies or a person is sick and you don't see the results but be encouraged to persevere until you see the darkness you see the works of darkness destroyed by the power of faith by grace that flows through you i hope this will clarify and will help you understand my heart and not feel anger or guilt or condemnation when I talk about taking responsibility for healing the sick. Amen. And if it doesn't work now, it will work next time. And even those who reach this level of awareness and responsibility, they usually look first in the wrong place for the cause of the lack of results. And that uh, I'll tell you what where, where they look. These people that finally take responsibility, they believe they, they are the problem, which is good. But, it is, but they believe that it's because of some sin in their lives or because of not enough faith. And that's wrong. It, in other words, they have faith in their faith. And that's not correct. We have to have faith in the grace of God, in the word of God, not in our faith. We, we should never say, I don't have enough faith. God has given us already the same measure of faith when we were born again. We have at least uh, a faith as the size of the mustard seed. We need to use that and grow it and strengthen it and establish it until it works much uh, more and more. So we always, we always have faith and sin as again. Even in your life, the person who prays for sick people will never stop healing flow through you because it was paid for on the cross and God loves people loves the people, loves to bless people, even though you will never be perfect. You will always have do sinful actions until the end of your life. But that doesn't stop God from healing and blessing people. So take that, that obstacle from your mind. And whenever you pray for sick people, pray with confidence. The only real cause and problem, as I said in Matthew 17, 20, is unbelief in the word in what Jesus has done on the cross. Meaning that these Christians that pray for sick people have Faith may be in the word, but it's not strong enough. It's not strengthened. And, and it needs perseverance. It needs uh, uh, to continually stay there, stay in that faith. Being in unbelief, which is the real cause, means one of the two things. Either we do not have yet enough understanding of the things that God, of God and how they work, like the gospel, like physical healing, or we might have that understanding and revelation, but the faith in that understanding is not strong and consistent enough. It's not strengthened. It's not persevered in enough, meaning that it did not penetrate the core of our heart. Amen. So we don't, we don't really believe it with all our heart, but it's superficial. But, but, but the more we proclaim it, the more we meditate on those scriptures, the more we pray in tongues, that faith grows. You build yourself in faith. And then when you release the words, the, the words have power. Let me give you an example about unbelief. 
Peter's claim from Luke 22 and uh, verse 33 or Matthew 26, 35, 26 verse 35, that he will never betray Jesus, but he will die for Jesus was full of faith. Remember Peter, he was full of faith and confidence at the time when he made the claim, Jesus, I will die for you. Even if all these disciples will, for, will forsake you, I will never forsake. He really believed with all his heart, with all his emotions. I don't think he lied when he said when he said that statement, he meant it with all his being. However, we find out later that his belief and confidence was superficial because there was something in his heart, there was fear in his heart that he wasn't aware and that uh, aware of, and that fear blocked his his. Uh, he didn't have results. He, that fear blocked his confidence from yielding the results or fruits of his confession, meaning that meaning to actually die for Jesus. He could not die because the fear that he wasn't aware of blocked that faith, that confidence. He was That faith was superficial still. And we see that after he received the Holy Spirit and Jesus was resurrected, uh, he became bolder and he became stronger. In faith. And in the end, he, he died for Christ, for Jesus Christ. In the same manner, when we pray for sick, for sick people, for the sick, we might sometimes be in unbelief without us even knowing it consciously. So I encourage you, keep pressing on, pressing on, pray in tongues, believe, proclaim. Here, I always say, I will heal the sick, I raise the dead, I cleanse the lepers, I cast out devils. That's my commandment, that's my calling, that's my mandate. And I will always do that as long as I live on this. I will pray for the sick, I will pray for the dead. And even if I don't see results, I will keep going. I will keep pressing on because that's the truth. That's the reality that Jesus Christ paid for. Hallelujah, I'm already getting too excited. So when we pray for healing for someone and don't see results immediately, we don't discourage but continue to pray maybe two or three more times at that moment and command the sickness to go with boldness. But if it still doesn't go, then we continue to pray for that person, maybe in our personal time of prayer and press on or every time we see that person until the sickness goes away completely. Sometimes the sickness goes in, in stages. So continue to pray, continue to persevere and believe God. And it happened to me that I prayed for, for sick and they even died. I was very discouraged. I was very put down in my faith and it took me a while to get up again. But that didn't stop me and it shouldn't stop us. Live to fight another day. Next time I will have more victory and more victory. I, from glory to glory, from faith to faith, until it will work spontaneously, immediately like it worked with Jesus. That is, that is what means to put flesh on the world. In this fight with sickness, we don't cancel the use of medicine. Medicine will, not, will never cancel faith. So genuine faith will work regardless. If you pray, even if you take medicine, if you're diabetic and you continue to take your medicine, when faith kicks in and heals you, you'll see that you will not be able to take any more uh, insulin or uh, for your sickness. So faith will continue to work if you're strong, regardless of you taking medicine or not. If you prayed for some time and nothing visible happened, the sickness didn't go away, but you know some medical treatment that could take away and fix your sickness or your disease immediately, then go ahead and take that medicine and don't feel guilty about it. God is not so stingy. He sees you and, and that doesn't mean you didn't have faith. You prayed, you put your faith, but if, if it's not, a, and if there is an easy way out and it, like a medicine and treatment, take it. God is not, um, he's a good God. He wants you to be healed. So if you go ahead and take that medicine, live to find that. I'm saying that especially when it comes to children. Don't exercise your faith on children. If you prayed and nothing happened, give them medicine, make them well. And, and if prayer did not work immediately, uh, give them the medicine, make them well and continue in faith, live to fight another day. That's the saying that I have lived to fight and I took it from some, some, other, some other preacher and I loved it and I, I took it in my life. And that's what I do. I continue, I press on. Let's move on to the fifth uh, thing of our inheritance, raising the dead. Super, that means supernatural ability to raise the dead is included in the gospel. And we will see it more and more as we get closer to the end of age, at the end of the age. Even in our time, there are people that are like Reinhard Bonnke, uh, like um, uh, Smith Wigglesworth and uh, many other who raised the dead, who raised people from the dead. And there are people who are raised from the dead by faith 
although not as many yet we don't see it every day but we will see it more and more and it's important for the, for the church for the body of Christ to get acquainted with this truth and start proclaiming it that because the more you receive it in you and proclaim it the more we will see it happening praise the Lord let's read a few verses that support that Matthew 10 8 I already read that. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. Another one, Luke 7, 22. And he answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. Jesus says, the, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them. So the dead were raised up during Jesus' life and he even raised Lazarus from the dead. And he was before the cross, all the more after the cross. And not only Lazarus, he, he raised a few people from the dead. A, a girl that was dead a few hours, a, a young man who was dead, he was going to the funeral, he, was dead, uh, he has been dead for a few days. And then Lazarus who has stayed in the tomb for, four, uh, for a few days. Jesus, we see the progress of faith in Jesus even, how he grew in his faith, in his wisdom, in his, in his power and raised the dead. Also John 20, 12 verse 1. Jesus therefore six days before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Jesus had, uh, as I said, raised from the dead Lazarus and Acts 9.40. But Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed and turning to the body he said, Tabitha arise. And she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter she sat up. This is a case of the apostles raising from the dead Tabitha after Jesus was uh, lifted up to, to, to head to the heavens. So uh, after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus went up to heaven. Acts 20 verses 9 to 10. And there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the window sill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the first floor and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him. And after embracing him, he said, do not be troubled for his life is in him. So this guy died apparently and he was uh, brought back to, to life by Paul, the Apostle Paul, which is again after Jesus, is, uh, Jesus has left. And I believe I'll talk today about three more things and I'll leave for the next session uh, two important issues. So I'll continue to talk about supernatural peace. That's another thing. That's another uh, part of our, the inheritance of the believer. And uh, that is covered in, uh, I'll give just four references uh, about that. John 16, John 16, verse 33. And it says this, let's read it together. Supernatural peace. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world, Jesus says. So peace is our right, is our inheritance. Whenever you experience distress or your heart is troubled or you don't have peace, that's illegal. Christ is in you. You're not supposed to be out of peace. Proclaim it in, in your prayer, in your time. Whenever you feel down or without peace, this is illegal. Jesus told me to not be afraid. In Him I can have peace. I walk in the shalom, in the peace of the Lord. Let's read one more verse. Romans 8, 6. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Whenever you think and meditate on the things about the things that God has given us freely, the things covered in the gospel, then you experience, when you set your mind on those things of the spirit, those are life and peace. This is the way to get peace, to live in peace, in continuous peace. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And we will talk about joy as well. And one more verse about peace. Romans 15 verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope, of all hope, of hope fill you with all joy and, and peace, says Paul, in believing. When you believe the God of hope, He is always the God of hope. Whenever you feel hopeless, 
And remember that just a perception of, uh, it's a mental, your mental perception of reality, but it's not the reality. God is a God of hope. He will always have hope for you and you can always have hope in Him. And when you believe that He is the God of hope, He will fill you immediately with all joy and peace so that you will abound in hope. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. You believe first and the power of the Holy Spirit is released in you and you abound in hope. You abound in joy, in peace. As you already seen, another uh, uh, part of our inheritance is supernatural abundant joy. And we see that in John 15 verse 11. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. He wants us to have joy to the full. The, the joy that Jesus gives us, God gives us by the Holy Spirit is nothing. It, it cannot compare to the joy that comes from the world. He wants us to have real joy to the full. That's our right. Whenever we see that we feel we don't have joy, let's pray and start declaring the word, I have joy. I have the joy of the Holy Spirit. That's the reality. In my spirit, I have abundant joy. When you believe that, when you put your trust in the God of hope, in the God of joy, in the Holy Spirit of joy, and you believe you are in the kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, and joy, then joy starts flowing through you and through and to the outside. John 16, 24. Uh, another verse about joy. Until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. Again, we see that uh, about joy being made full. And I read Romans 14, 17, which says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And one more verse about joy comes from 1 John 1, 4. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Again, the, the whole New Testament, Paul and Philippians, I think, says, Rejoice always in the Lord. Rejoice. I say rejoice. Joy is our birthright. Peace is our birthright. And uh, not only joy and peace, but also supernatural wisdom. That supernatural, practical, and even unconscious wisdom in the affairs and decisions of life. Being in the right place at the right time without even trying or struggling or saying the right thing. And, uh, and taking the right decisions that move you from, from a level to success to another level of success, from to prosperity to victory. When you pray in tongues especially, that wisdom is taken out through you and you don't even realize it. In this decision at your work, in ministry, uh, in your family, you will take, you'll start taking wise decisions uh, or decisions from the Spirit of God. Let's see a few verses that support that, uh, the, that wisdom is part of our birthright in, in, in the new, as a new creation. 1 Corinthians 1.30 but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus Christ is our wisdom. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. We are the wisdom of God in Christ. Can you say that about you? I am the wisdom of God in Christ Jesus. I am wisdom. I walk in wisdom. My words are wisdom. You will see more and more in your life the wisdom of God unfolding and unveiling. And one more passage here, Colossians uh, uh, 2 verses 1 to 3. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for all of those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus Christ are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge and we have access to it to all wisdom to all knowledge by praying in tongues by praying in the spirit by meditating on the word of god we can have access to that that's our birthright and i will uh, close this session with two memory verses uh from um one is romans 14 17 and let's read it together that's for the kingdom of god is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let's say it together. For the kingdom of God 
is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And the second verse comes from 1 Peter 2.24. That by His stripes we were healed. By His wounds we were healed. And He Himself bore our sin in His body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by His wounds you were healed. Let's personalize it. And He Himself bore my sins in His body on the cross, so that I might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by His wounds I was healed. Praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you. And this is the first part uh, of the inheritance of the new creation. I'll continue in the next session with the second part. I still have two big items, two big things to talk about uh, 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 that are included in this inheritance as birthright, which is for freedom from generational cur curses and prosperity, divine prosperity and spiritual blessings and physical blessings. So until we meet next time, may God bless you and in increase, and grant you to increase in revelation, in joy, in peace, in wisdom, to, to cause you to walk in an increased measure of wisdom, of joy, of peace, of divine health, divine victory, success, and uh, holiness, freedom of condemnation, all these good things, good things that Jesus Christ paid for on the cross, and we have them freely. They are free. They are not cheap, but they are free, and we can enjoy them here on earth and bless other people uh, with them. That's God's desire. That's God's goodness, and I pray that we will excel in those and continue to press on in faith and make God proud. May God boast with us in the heavenly places, in the, uh, in the face of His angels, of His heavenly creatures, to boast with you. Uh, with your faith, with your pressing on, with your perseverance. Make God proud. I'm saying that in a good way, not to work for rights, but make Him proud, make Him happy, like that He would delight in us. He already loves us so much, but He delights when we, He sees His children putting the faith in His grace, in His Word. May God bless you in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.